Good morning. I'm uh, Joe Nesgoda. I'd like to discuss uh, SDOCT findings in choroidal melanoma with you this morning. So to begin this talk, we really have to start with one of the most important studies in ocular oncology. The Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study, or COMS, was the first multi-centered randomized control trial to assess treatment modalities for ocular melanoma. Now, the protocol divided these melanomas into three categories, small, medium, large, depending on their size. COMS looked at the natural history of these tumors. In particular, I'm going to focus on small size melanomas. Now, treatment began when the tu tumor growth was documented to increase from small to medium size, as defined by the, by the study. Now, features that are predictive of tumor growth were also determined. Now, um, something very important that I want to point out, and I want us to keep in mind throughout the uh, the rest of this talk is that bottom line there that, again, these are small size tumors, and at uh, eight years, there was a 7% mortality. Now, these were lesions that were small and then ultimately had grave consequences uh, on the patient. Now, the problem is how do we diagnose these? How do you look at something and say, is this a benign nevus that won't bother this patient or something that, that needs to be treated? Um, early detection of them may lead to better prognosis in both local treatment and control and prevention of systemic metastasis. Now, growth is controversial because large benign nevi may exhibit growth and never transform into malignancy. Um, I, I'm going to use a term indeterminate choroidal melanocytic lesions. You'll see IML uh, later in the presentation and throughout. Um, as the terminology that was given for these reasons. The factors that were cited by comms, uh, there were a few. You can see them before you, in including uh, diameter and depth, presence of orange pigment, and subretinal fluid. Now, in the comms, uh, they particularly focused on clinical examination. Imaging modalities such as uh, B-scan and uh, FA were, have been shown to have um, significance in melanomas and whether they transform. But in comms, they really focused on, uh, on clinical exam. This is not a small melanoma. This is actually a, quite a large one. Um, you can see here, I think this is an excellent example of one of those factors. You see geographic orange pigment there and there and all around. And uh, the question is, how do we keep from going to something small to something large like this? Granted, this may have been diagnosed at, at this time, at this point in time. However, we want to basically keep, uh, keep something like this away, very near the, it's right on top of the optic nerve, large. This doesn't have a good a prognosis as something that was possibly caught earlier. So can we do better? Now, uh, diagnostic imaging um, has, has been emerging, obviously, as technology has grown. Um, neuropathology and uh, something such as cardiac valve function, cardiomyopathy, imaging modality in those fields has really become the sine qua non of diagnosis. Without an MRI at this point, you would be hard pressed to say someone's had um, an ischemic event, and it would certainly be a first step in diagnosing a tumor. Um, diagnoses has come has evolved as long as medicine has. Over 2,000 years ago, the idea of uh, apoplexy was thought to be uh, hypothesized possibly to even be an ischemic event, which would cause a stroke. Um, from that time until now, clinical diagnosis is and still is the cornerstone of medicine, obviously. Um, however, with technology, we've been able to uh, even look at acute stroke and in sometimes uh, detecting them in 83% of patients, which is a drastic leap from even the pre prior technology, CT, which was the standard at that time, which was a great leap from physical diagnosis even. So now, can we bring that to this field? Um, obviously, we use OCT almost on a regular basis. Um, I, see, uh, I see Jeffrey here, who uh, does an excellent job uh, with that. We use OCT in many different areas. Um, <clears throat> our lesions, uh, they cause extrinsic effects on the retina and the RPE, causing subretinal deposits, fluid, and RPE regularity. Now, as, uh, spectral domain OCT is non-invasive, and it's highly sensitive. And we've been using this, um, obviously, for macular edema and other um, AMD and other issues regularly. 
It's not currently in the diagnostic criteria for these small melanomas. Um, before SDOCT time domain found that secondary retinal changes can be shown in cases of choroidal nea by a melanoma, SDOCT uh, provides an increased sensitivity and is less prone to motion artifact. Now, the purpose of this study is to look at um, the rates of subretinal fluid and deposition such as drusen orange pigment, looking at a series and to see if we can tell uh, fluid earlier on the OCT and, and these other elements earlier than if we could on stereo photos at the VA. We took 10 consecutive patients, um, VA patients, and uh, we took stereo photos and OCT and we showed them to our, uh, our fellowship trained uh, faculty and we said, Are, is there subretinal fluid? Essentially as simple as that. What do we find? That SDOCT detected retinal, subretinal fluid in 80% of the patients but was often missed on stereo photos. We're talking about very small amounts of fluid, but that is certainly there that we can see on OCT. Um, Drusen detection was more comparable, but slightly better. Uh, the p-value was not, uh, not quite significant here. And orange pigment really isn't, um, isn't detected. Uh, it's not the right uh, imaging modality with OCT. However, just of note, they were found in 30% of the patients. And there was no difference between the stereo photo examination it was, and what was found in the electronic medical record in the chart. Here are some of the images. Um, you can see um, this is the, uh, the SDOCT here. And you can see small amounts of fluid on the cut. And if you look at the photo, although it's not very large and not in stereo, um, not necessarily in all cases could you see the fluid. Here's some more, uh, you can see the drusenoid changes there. Um, and this, just um, as a demonstration, you, uh, you can find cystoid interretinal spaces, these large cysts inside of uh, melanomas. So what are our conclusions? That SDOCT provides a valuable adjunct to the clinical exam for detection of subretinal fluid and drusenoid changes. Now, uh, the findings in OCD combined with clinical examination led to the reclassification of six of these patients, and they were referred uh, to a, uh, an oncologist. Um, it's possible that earlier detection of subretinal fluid with this technology can lead to an earlier, earlier treatment by, uh, by changing their, uh, their classification and a better prognosis in general. Now, the study, of course, was limited. Clinical significance of this is unknown. This study does not address that, and there is no study to address it. If you find this fluid that's subclinical, it doesn't matter. We know that fluid that you can see on exam does matter. That does correlate. But does the subclinical fluid? I don't know. If uh, the pathophysiology is, is not really clear. Now, the, there is a risk, of course, of exposing patients to harmful treatment. Um, if you look at, at other diseases, uh, in particular in the in prostate, um, there's been a lot of controversy about you know whether uh, blood tests should be done because patients were being treated unnecessarily and outcomes were worse. There's obviously the risk here of exposing a patient to something such as radiation, which is certainly not benign in a case that may never transform into anything uh, significant for the patient. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's technical difficulty in imaging peripheral lesions with um, SDOCT. It's uh, mainly its greatest uses in the posterior pole. Um, as, as I mentioned before, nevi have also shown to have subretinal fluid. And in this case, they're not uh, malignant in any way. Now, the pathophysiology of that subretinal fluid is unclear. If you have something that's malignant and you, uh, you give it access to a vascular bed with permeability, it's possible it may spread and there may be metastases. Also, if there's uh, an acuity of growth, it could acutely damage the RPE pump and thus cause the subretinal fluid. But again, these are also unclear. The series was small and a VA po patient population. Um, and. Uh, in, in prior studies, um, OCT wasn't available for the comms criteria, but now it is. So that'll be, um, that'll be something good. So future studies. Um, this, I'd like to increase the power of the study and combine other data sets. Looking at nevi in a set would also be helpful, maybe comparing, say, 30 nevi, see if it has subretinal fluid, and follow them. Autofluorescence uh, was obtained in these patients, not looked at in the study, but they, that also may have a role as a new imaging technique and may also have its own set of findings that may be useful for characterizing these lesions. I want to thank everyone involved with this and congratulate uh, our graduates.
Thank you very much.